Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I have, I've got to warn you, I have got man flu at the moment. So appreciate uh, Fiona just giving me some sympathy there. Um, so I'll struggle on. Um, yeah, so welcome to today. We're doing a webinar on managing conflicts and code of conduct breaches. My name is John Fagan, CEO of Scribe. We've got Fiona, I'll introduce her in a minute. And yes, we've also got Jess on hand take, uh, from Scribe taking care of any uh, chat, etc. Yeah, so Fiona is a solicitor and professional practice development manager at MP Law. Uh, before joining MP Law, she was appointed to an independent person for District Council under the Localism Act. So through this, she saw a lot of complaints um, which were referred to her, which she had to review to be considered whether to determine their breach of councillor's code of conduct. Um, yeah, so I think she's pretty much qualified to talk about this topic. Um, so over to you, Fiona. So thanks very much for that introduction, John. Um, it's really nice to um, to be here with you and uh, thank you all for dragging yourselves out of your sick beds. I feel a little bit guilty for feeling quite well this morning. So um, it's lovely to see so many of you here. So as John said, I'm, um, I'm a solicitor. I'm the Practice and Professional Development Manager at NP Law, which is a shared local authority legal service um, based at Norfolk County Council. So basically we act for um, other local authorities. Um, we're not able to act for individuals. Um, and so we get quite a wide range of people coming to us in terms of, I say people, public bodies. Um, and we also do um, standards investigations, which is uh, something that I feel really passionate about. Um, as John said, I used to be an independent person actually for, for a district council and a city council. Um, for several years before I joined MP Law and really enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoyed seeing all the different complaints coming through and it was fascinating to see how they were tackled or actually sometimes not tackled um, because by the time they got to me, um, they had obviously escalated into, into a formal complaint. So, um, what I want to talk to you about this morning is, is conflict. Really interesting to see the results of that poll this morning, um, to have 92% of you having experienced some form of conflict, um, really interesting. And obviously, you know, as a lawyer, and I think someone put in the chat, we, we want to know about definitions. So what is conflict? And it means different things to, to different people. But also really interesting that there was a bit of a split about um, how they've been dealt with and good to see actually that that most 58 percent have been dealt with informally um, but what I'll talk to you about today is is the two different methods really of, of dealing with complaints obviously conflict can develop anywhere um, not just in in town and parish councils but I think it's particularly so when um, there are potentially controversial or difficult decisions to be made. And that's what you're doing in your town and parish councils every day. Um, and people sometimes find it quite difficult to deal with others who hold different views to themselves and perhaps don't share the same sorts of values. And that can cause tension and upset. But disagreement um, is part of the political process in a healthy democracy. So we have to live with some level of disagreement or conflict. But ultimately, we want to make sure that, um, that the town or parish council can function effectively. And that's best done when any disagreements are dealt with maturely and not on a personal level. So um, when I was thinking about how we could look at, look at resolving conflicts, um, I thought, of course, of this very old, uh, I don't know how, how old some of you are uh, and whether you can remember about p -p 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 pick up penguins, but um, I thought of the four Ps. Um, so personal persuasion, peer pressure, 
political parties and procedures. And I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail. Um, but I'm going to start with the, the first three um, before we get on to more formal procedures. And the, the persuasion, the peer pressure and the political parties were all mentioned in the 2019 report by the Committee on Standards in Public Life into uh, ethical local government standards. Um, and they were pinpointed as a means of informal resolution of issues. So I thought we'd just explore those um, a little bit more uh, just now. So persuasion um, or you know discussions, informal discussions are really where we'd like to start uh, if we're in a, a, a situation where there's conflict. Um, so with the informal measures. And that really is a, a direct conversation with someone. And often that can actually be really difficult, um, particularly if, if you are the one who's been affected and you're maybe feeling upset, angry, all sorts of different emotions. It's actually quite difficult to have a, a reasonable conversation with someone who you may feel has personally attacked you. But direct conversations can help. Sometimes people don't know um, that they've upset you uh, and that they are oblivious to it. But what I would say is in having that conversation, try to make sure that it's um, not going to destroy any ongoing relationships, either with that person or with others. And it's usually best to have a, a healthy and respectful conversation um, my advice would be not to do it publicly, um, but to you know, take somebody aside and talk to them um, gently. Understand each other's viewpoints, um, because you are probably coming from very different places, and possibly explain what the issues are. And it doesn't mean that you're going to end as friends, but hopefully it will diffuse the situation. Moving kind of almost back a little step, it, I, I think it helps a lot to have um, really good pre-existing relationships um, with the people that you're working with. And I think sometimes that's quite difficult if they've come in or you've come in and, and you're joining an established group. Um, so what I would say is as a parish council and how you function, it's sometimes really useful to take a step back and to look at methods of fostering relationships where you can. So is there something that you can do that creates a, a, a kind of um, community feel about what you're doing? So is it possible to have, for example, joint training, uh, possibly joint training on standards, but on anything really um, that can help you to understand each other's viewpoints and perhaps to uh, find some shared or common values. So what we'd like is that, you know, just a little chat helps. If it doesn't, what next? Um, so my next P is peer pressure. Um, and thinking about sometimes that individual might not listen to you, but is there somebody else that they might listen to? Um, is there somebody who might be able to influence them that you could talk to and ask if they could have a private word with that person? Um, sometimes it might be uh, the chair. Um, it, it obviously depends where, they, where the conflict is coming from, um, but that can be quite helpful just perhaps to ask somebody else to step in and help out. So the, the third P uh, is political parties. Um, now, I appreciate that in a lot of parish councils, you're not going to have political parties, um, particularly the smaller ones. But in some, uh, and again, town councils particularly, they do become quite politicised. And parties can actually be powerful. Um, they don't want their own reputation to be tainted. They're very aware that um, they are elected often on their party rather than on their name. 
And so they may be willing to step in if they feel um, that someone is stepping out of line. So you can ask them to have discussions um, with the person who's causing personal people who are causing problems. Um, again, on the larger uh, town councils, if there are any outside bodies or committees that perhaps those councillors are sitting on, um, then it might be possible for the political parties to remove those people from those appointments. So whilst political parties aren't decision makers, um, they can be a really legitimate part of this process. But what if talking fails? Um, we then need to move on to procedures um, and usually formal procedures. So if those informal methods don't work, we need to fall back on the procedures that we already have in place. Um, and that's what I'll talk about in a bit more detail for the, the next um, 20 minutes or so. So, uh, gosh, remember back all those years um, to the coalition government in 2010. Um, pretty soon after coming into power, the coalition government talked about it. It had a, a programme for government that it introduced um, in May of that year. And it abolished the old standards board regime, uh, which used to regulate um, councillors' conduct, and instead brought in the Localism Act 2011. And that introduced um, local codes of conduct rather than a national one, based on the Nolan principles, which we'll talk about in a moment. It also brought in local responsibility rather than central responsibility for investigating breaches of codes of conduct. And um, it also meant that the monitoring officer for the principal authority would establish and maintain a register of members' interests and would also look into um, complaints. So in the Localism Act, Localism Act is huge, um, but chapter seven uh, of the Localism Act um, talks about the duty to promote and maintain high standards of conduct. So the relevant authority has to promote and maintain those high standards of conduct uh, for people who are within the authority. Um, and also um, in discharging its duty under subsection one, which is missed out there, um, the relevant authority should adopt a code. So you will, I hope, uh, all have a code of conduct. Um, and it will be consistent with the, the Nolan principles or the, the seven principles of public life. Those phrases are used um, interchangeably after Lord Nolan, who introduced, um, introduced these following a report into public standards. Um, and basically everyone in public office needs to understand and uphold these seven principles. And I'll just go through very briefly, they're, they're sort of self-explanatory, but very briefly uh, talk about what they are. So selflessness um, means that you should be acting solely in the public interest. So forget anything to do with, with you as a councillor. Um, you should have integrity. So really important that you avoid placing yourself any under, under any obligation to anybody else. Um, any people or any organisations that might try to influence a councillor inappropriately. Objectivity, really important. So um, stand back, think about things impartially and don't think about, again, going back to the selflessness and integrity. Think about what's best for uh, your constituents, your community. Accountability is fairly obvious. Um, you should be accountable to the public for your decision making. You're actually making quite a lot of really important decisions. Um, and also to submit yourself if you're a councillor to public scrutiny. Um, moving on to openness. Um, decision making should be fair and transparent. And 
reasons should be given uh, where possible so that people understand why decisions have been reached that will affect them uh, in the local community. Goes to say uh, that everybody should be truthful and honest. And in terms of leadership, I think this is an interesting, um, an interesting principle. Um, and what no Lord Nolan said is that holders of public office should exhibit uh, all these principles in their own behaviour. They should actively promote and robustly support the principles and be willing to challenge poor behaviour wherever it occurs, which kind of feeds into what we're talking about uh, when we see poor behaviour. So I said that you will have um, a code of conduct. Uh, the LGA, uh, the Local Government Association, brought out a, a model code of conduct in 2020, which has been tweaked a little bit since 2020. Um, and this again was, was um, following the recommendations in the um, Committee for Standards and Public Life's report on ethical standards in local government. And it was a recommendation that there should be uh, a kind of universal code of conduct, but um, it isn't an obligation to have this particular code of conduct, it's just a suggestion. Um, it's particularly useful for town and parish councils to adopt the same or similar uh, code of conduct to their principal authority, so the, the district council or the, um, the, the city council. Um, and that's so that you have, again, shared sets of values. And if you have twin hatters, um, so someone who's perhaps on a, on a parish council and a district council, they're not working to two different codes of conduct because that can be quite confusing. And also you don't want councillors saying, oh, well, I thought I was following one code and not the other. So the LGA's code of conduct is really, it, it, it's very simply written. Um, it covers the main principles and there's also some really good guidance which has been published by the LGA to go with um, that code of conduct. So although you don't have to adopt it, um, it's certainly something that I would suggest you discuss as a town or parish council if you haven't already. Um, and also that you discuss it with the monitoring officer of your principal authority. And in introducing new codes of conduct, again, that can often be a, a catalyst for change. It can be a way of leveling things up, restarting and perhaps resetting relationships. And also, you know, perhaps having some training uh, and a shared understanding of, um, of what it is that you're working towards. So I just thought I would um, pull up some common issues that, um, that we come across in terms of breaches of the code of conduct or at least complaints. Um, and they tend to be, I've set them out here, I won't go through all of them, but they tend to be things like uh, failing to declare an interest, so not acting selflessly. Um, and then things that cause tensions, bullying, being disrespectful, uh, being disruptive perhaps in meetings, um, and then the kind of the nebulous things like behaviour likely to bring the authority or the, the town of parish council into disrepute. Um, and social media, which I'll talk about a little bit later on because that can cause some real issues. So I'm guessing that some of these are going to sound quite familiar um, to, to most of you. Uh, and that's whether they are dealt with formally or informally, these tend to be the things that cause the most problems. So with formal complaints, um, principal local authorities have to have mechanisms to investigate any allegations of a breach of the code um, and also then arrangements for dealing uh, with formal complaints. Parish councils and town councils don't have their own arrangements for dealing with complaints, and that's because those complaints are dealt with by the monitoring officer of the principal council, the district council. Um, so that's important to note that it, it feels a little bit 
removed um, and you have less control over how complaints are dealt with. Again, that's why I think it's really helpful to have a, an ongoing dialogue and a relationship with the monitoring officer in your principal authority. I'm very aware that some local councils don't have that relationship, but again, worth having a talk about and um, maybe you could get that monitoring officer to come along to one of your meetings and talk about the importance of complaints and perhaps even talk you through um, what the arrangements are in terms of how they will deal with a formal complaint. Um, I thought I'd just add in here that uh, again this, this um, Committee on Standards in Public Life, the report that I talked about, suggests as best practice, but it doesn't have to be done, that um, if complaints are being made by the clerk um, so that they are worried about behaviour by a parish council, then it actually should be the chair or the parish council itself that, that refers um, that councillor for a complaint to the monitoring officer rather than the clerk. So again, that kind of removes the clerk from having to do that. Obviously, there are issues uh, if the complaint is being made by the clerk about the chair. Um, and that, yeah, that's something that does happen. So, um, as I said, it's the principal authority who undertakes formal investigations of code breaches by parish councillors. They will have different uh, different types of, um, of mechanisms, so there's no one set mechanism. But again, the Local Government Association has set out a really nice, um, they have really nice guidance um, about code of conduct complaints handling. And that's worth having a look at so that you can understand how it might be that the principal authority will approach um, any complaints made about a councillor. So what does happen? Well, some of the time the, the monitoring officer will have a look at the complaint and it just isn't going to be something that falls within the code of conduct. And if that's the case, then the monitoring officer will tell the complainant um, that no action will be taken. It doesn't necessarily mean that it stops there. Um, if the monitoring officer is aware that there are sort of rumblings coming through that don't necessarily meet the threshold of a breach, um, but that there's obviously some sort of conflict or dysfunction within a parish council, then um, they might want to think about what they can do about it. You know, might they go along to a meeting and have a chat? Might they talk to the chair about it? Might they actually offer direct training? So there are things that the monitoring officer might want to do. Um, or they could think, actually, this, this probably is a complaint that falls within the code of conduct, but are there any other solutions? So might it be that we could just ask the, the, the person who's being complained about to give an apology? Um, or maybe they could say, um, you know, explain their position to the person who's made the complaint. So even though we, we've sort of moved into the realms of formal procedures, it's still always helpful to explore whether we might be able to deal with something in, in a less formal manner. Um, because if we can do that, people tend to be less polarised. Um, and you know, we never really like to, to escalate things too much, um, which seems strange as a lawyer. Uh, that I should be saying that, but you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't need lawyers. Um, but sadly, we we don't live in that ideal world. So, I've set out here some key principles that a fair procedure requires, and that is that the complaint should be investigated and precise allegations identified. Now, this is a real bugbear for me. So, when I was an independent person. Often we would get complaints that are just um, they're quite unstructured and quite a ramble. And it was sometimes really quite difficult to pull out what exactly was being complained about. Um, so it's really important if someone is making a complaint, if they can actually identify 
what it is that they're, they're concerned about. So sometimes people would have a completely legitimate complaint in there somewhere. Um, but then there'd be other bits and there'd be almost too much detail, you know, cancel somebody or other rolled their eyes and crossed their arms and crossed their legs well that's that's not nice and it's probably a little bit disrespectful but uh in there somewhere might also be something really important about their you know, previous bullying behavior for example but it's sometimes we sometimes get a little bit bogged down in detail um so really important that that the evidence that's available is clearly identified and disclosed. So again, um, I used to have to look at minutes of meetings and sometimes those minutes were a little bit broad brush and what was alleged to have been said or even discussed in that meeting wasn't necessarily there. So it's important if there is going to be an investigation um, that whoever's investigating it is aware of what's being said who was present, um, all those kinds of things so that they can investigate properly. Really important that the person who's being complained about has a good opportunity to respond to the complaints um, and also to the investigation. And then finally, again, this is a bit of a lawyery thing, um, any response to the complaint should be proportional to or proportionate to the um to the behavior that's been complained of and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on so when we are investigating uh what the model code of conduct uh deals with is it, it talks about compliance uh with the code of conduct and um at paragraph eight uh it, it says that as a counsellor if training is provided by the local authority then they should undertake code of conduct training but also moving on to the important bits i as a counsellor cooperate with any code of conduct investigation and or determination i don't intimidate or attempt to intimidate anybody who's involved with those investigations or proceedings and also that as a counsellor i comply with any sanctions if i um, if it's been found that I have breached the code of conduct. So that's what you want to have in your code of conduct. You want to have counsellors signing up to go along with the process um, and you don't want them opting out because that, again, can be really difficult. Um, and it can also, again, feel quite disrespectful to the, the person who has made the complaint. And sometimes... Uh, again, when I was an independent person, I used to find sometimes that I'd read the complaint um, and actually what was being complained about wasn't really bad. But what was bad was the councillor's response to that complaint uh, when they saw the allegations. And at that point, they often became extremely rude and abusive. Um, so it's really important as a councillor, if you are complained about, that you are measured in your response. So often an investigation report will take place. Um, so sometimes if it's relatively straightforward, it would be the monitoring officer who will just investigate. A lot of the time it will go out to an independent investigator. So um, at NP Law, that's what we do. We act on behalf of principal authorities and we'll happily go out and investigate. Um, I say go out, uh, actually. In the last one I undertook was, was all from my dining room, uh, apart from the final hearing. So the report will uh, set out the evidence, um, talk about the witnesses who have been um, who have been talked to um, and also set out the subject members side of the story. And then a conclusion will be reached which should follow a sort of a, a thread, you know, that there should be a, a sensible conclusion given the evidence and there will be recommendations as to whether or not the code was breached. They are simply recommendations, they're no more than that. If the conclusion from the investigator is that the code of conduct hasn't been breached, then that's likely to be the end of it. Even if there's a, a recommendation that there has been a breach, 
Again, if we can take that opportunity to resolve things informally, the monitoring officer might resolve it without a hearing. Um, if, for example, an apology is acceptable and is proportionate at that stage. Sometimes it will be necessary to have a hearing. Um, and in that case, it will go off to the principal authorities, uh, either their standards um, committee, sometimes it's an audit committee. Um, it will depend on the local arrangements for the principal authority. Um, I've spoken about being an independent person and they have a role throughout this process. So the Localism Act 2011 requires a council, a principal council, to appoint at least one independent person whose views should be sought and taken into account. Um, and that's before the authority makes its decision um, on an allegation that it's decided to investigate. And the independent person is used differently in different authorities. So in some, they have a really proactive role and in others, they're just, um, just well, maybe sidelined a little bit. And I think that's a shame um, because they can be seen as a very strong and, and you know, it's great to have somebody independent of the process that you think isn't biased. So they can assist the monitoring officer. They can be seen as a consultee during the pre-investigation process, the investigation process and the hearings. Um, but also, and again, I don't think this is advertised enough, the subject member, so the person who's been complained about can also consult the independent person. Um, independent persons were, were actually a very last minute add-on uh, when the Localism Act 2011 was going through. And they were intended to have that, that element of standing back from everything and a, a kind of independent oversight. Um, so it's worth knowing who your independent person is in your principal authority. And again, um, I think it's, it's sometimes quite helpful to have them to come and chat. Um, so to come and have a chat to you at, um, at your parish council, or perhaps, you know, to, to have um, a number of parish councils together where the independent person goes and, um, and talks to them and explains their role, uh, because it's, it, it's a really useful uh, and interesting role. And they can also, I mean, again, uh, they can also have a role in identifying themes in a dysfunctional council or identifying themes across a number of different parish councils. Um, and they can highlight to the monitoring officer and say, do you know what, we've got a bit of a problem with X, Y or Z happening. Um, could we put on a training course, you know, perhaps lots of complaints about how people are behaving on social media. Rather than just having lots of complaints coming in and reacting to those, it can be quite helpful to have a, a proactive stance. Um, and, you know, actually, it it saves time in the long run, um, time and money uh, for investigations if people know where they are um, through training. So um, I've popped in independent persons there, they're, they're useful throughout the procedure. One of the things that the investigation will look at is, well, the main thing the investigation is gonna be looking at is, is there a breach? And for me, there are kind of three different things going on there. So, does the code apply to the actions complained of? Is the behaviour covered by the code? And also then we need to go and look at Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So I'm going to take each of those in turn. Um, does the code apply to the actions complained of? So was the member actually acting as a member of the council at the time? Um, so it depends. Um, the code will apply as soon as an individual signs a declaration accepting office of councillor or if they're a co-opted member um, from the time, oh, I've moved on there, uh, from the time um, that they attend their first meeting. 
and this continues until they cease to be a counsellor. But it's not just about when they actually are acting as a counsellor, it's also when they give the impression of doing so. And that's, um, and I'm going to quote here, when they would give the impression to a reasonable member of the public with knowledge of all the facts that they are acting as a counsellor. So, you know, if you're just shopping somewhere in your local community and it's a Saturday morning and you're just chatting in the shop, that's unlikely to be acting as a counsellor. Uh, if you're doing that, having that same conversation during a council meeting, you're probably very clearly acting as a counsellor. So just if you are one of the parish councillors, just be mindful of what impression you're giving. And it applies to absolutely every type of communication. So again, whatever you're doing, um, think about what it is that, that, that you're doing and how you're communicating. Social media, as I mentioned, is, is one of the main things that is complained about. Um, and I'm not terribly sure why, I think we have this, this term of keyboard warriors, don't we? Um, that sometimes it's easier if you're a little bit faceless, uh, if you can't see who you're harming, um, it's sometimes just to type out unpleasant things. So people need to be really careful using social media and um, the Civility and Respect Project, which I'll talk about a little bit later, has produced some really helpful social media guidance. And again, you may want to think about training on social media and how it's used. It has great benefits to communicate with people, um, but equally it can attract difficult comments. Is the behaviour complained of covered by the code? Well, we hope so, um, but often it's simply um, when you actually come to look at the code, you realise that sometimes it isn't covered. Um, and like everything, things are kind of, you know, codes are often a response to something and they're introduced almost the wrong way around. So just be careful when you are looking at your code. It doesn't always mean that it's perfect. And um, actually, the um, Greater London Authority uh, had a good look at their code um, when they were considering Boris Johnson's behaviour uh, when he was the London mayor. And uh, they decided that their code was a little bit deficient. Um, so uh, I thought that was interesting. I love this picture. You just kind of wonder what, what he's saying and what she's thinking. Um, the other thing that we need to think about is Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So um, European Convention on Human Rights is something that we signed up to um, after the Second World War, a response to the Second World War. So it's nothing to do with the European Union. Um, we have mutterings that we're going to have a new Bill of Rights um, being introduced uh, since Dominic Raab's gone back to the Ministry of Justice. Um, but that won't affect us being a signatory to the European Convention. It will just mean that we can't enforce our rights so well through our own courts in this country and we will have to go back to the um the european court in strasbourg but what we need to think about is article 10 of the european convention on human rights which says that everybody has the right to freedom of expression um, and what the court in strasbourg has said um, is that freedom of expression is important They've also said it's especially so for an elected representative of the people. He represents his electorate, draws attention to their preoccupations and defends their interest. So this court, this, this case goes on to say that um, it's applicable not only to information and ideas that are favourably received or are inoffensive, um, but also to those that offend shock or disturb such are the demands of that pluralism tolerance and broad-mindedness without which there is no democratic society so basically what the european court has said is that in politics 
actually you can, as a politician, offend, shock and disturb people to a certain extent. Um, and that was reiterated in, um, in our courts in 2014 in the case of Heaston. And it was said that what Article 10 does is it doesn't just protect what is said, but also how it's said. And in the political context, a degree of the immoderate, offensive, shocking, disturbing, exaggerated, provocative, and where they get all these words from, polemical, colourful, emotive, non-rational and aggressive, that would not be acceptable outside the political context, is tolerated. They also, in that case, go on to say that therefore politicians are subject to wider limits of acceptable criticism. So they can say more, but also in return, they are expected and required to have thicker skins and have more tolerance to comment than ordinary citizens. I think sometimes people find that a little bit controversial, um, but that is, that's the law as it stands. Um, there's a recent case of Robinson really where this was um, this was reiterated. Um, a councillor was a parish councillor was accused of bringing the council that their fellow parish councillors actually and therefore the parish council into disrepute um, by alleging some bias and predetermination. Um, and he applied for judicial review of the monitoring officer's decision at the principal council and the high court um, upheld his complaint and uh, basically reiterated um, that because this was part of the political debate it was acceptable. So what happens if a breach of code of conduct is found? Well actually not very much. Um, councillors can't be suspended, there are certain sanctions which I've set out there, but it's not very much. Um, and a lot of people think that that's a bit of an issue because the sanctions are not huge. For some people, it's really embarrassing to have, for example, public censure. Um, for others, um, it's a bit of a badge of honour. There's clearly a problem, and we saw that from our starting poll, there's clearly a problem with um, <clears throat> civility and respect and conflict within um, parish councils. So um, the National Council uh, Association of Local Councils, NALC, and the Society of Local Council Clerks, SLCC, um, has set up a civility and respect project um, and you'll see that one of the publications that I mentioned earlier on social media uh, guidance is something that came out of that, of those discussions. Um, not content with that, we also have the Local Government Association has launched a campaign uh, called Debate Not Hate um, and looking at the impacts, the impacts of abuse on local democracy. Um, and they're currently calling for evidence around um, the levels of abuse and intimidation within um, within the local government community. So uh, you'll find that uh, I think uh, John mentioned at the beginning that um, it was very difficult for me to do a five minute talk. Uh, I've done a 50 minute talk. Um, I could talk on for absolutely ages, but I'm going to stop there um, and see if there are any questions. Um, Great. Thank you, Fiona. Much appreciated. Um, I love the p -p 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 pick up a penguin, um, you know, so that will always be in people's heads now, you know, when they're facing a situation where there's conflict, um, they can think of these penguins coming to their rescue. So you gave that excellent four step uh, escalation process based on the four P's with persuasion, peer pressure political parties and procedure so it's like uh yeah it, it's a great great format there super simple so um we've had some questions um it'd be great for the people that have asked questions on chat could re-ask them by turning on their uh camera and unmute themselves uh we'll kick off uh with sally uh, are you there sally 
and you can unshare your screen uh, if you're able to, Fiona. Uh, so you down the bottom. Uh, actually, I might be able to unshare for you. Well, click on share screen and actually I'll just share and then um, uh, that will kick you off probably. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm here. Can we answer my question, John? Yeah, fire away. Yeah, I was just asking uh, whether there was a requirement from the monitor officer at the principal authority to provide training to town and parish councils. So there's not a requirement, but I think it's a jolly good idea. Um, and I think some of the time, you know, the monitoring officer has an awful lot to do. They're dealing with their own council. Um, they're dealing with lots of other town and parish councils. However, in my view, it's a time-saving uh, investment um, because if that monitoring officer or, or you know, someone that they commission could give that training, I think it stops problems arising in the long run. I'm not saying it's a solution to everything, but um, it can be really helpful. So no, there's no obligation, but I think sometimes busy monitoring officers don't necessarily think about it. Or they might think, oh, well, we did that a couple of years ago without realising that there might be some new people who would benefit from it. So my good practice would be that it's offered yearly. Um, and it can be, you know, it's so easy to do training nowadays. People can just hop on on a, on a similar, um, you know, similar venue to this um, and listen to what the monitoring officer has to say. Um, so my view is that it, it it is really helpful and i've just seen veronica pop up a question there saying do i think training will be compulsory in the future sadly i don't think it will but i would love it to be um you know it, it, we're we're asking people to give up their time to actually do a lot for their communities and they're often using public money um, you know, they're they have the ability to raise a precept. It's a really important role, and I think that sometimes it's underestimated. So I think in return, we could ask them to do an hour's training. Um, but, you know, that's my suggestion. Um, I do think, as I said, Sally, that there's a real, um, there's a real value in local councils talking to their monitoring officer. And again, I know they're rushed off their feet and busy. I know ours absolutely is. But it's about that investment and it's also about establishing relationships. And it means if you have that existing relationship, that if you think something's going wrong in your council, you can chat to them on an informal basis. You know, it's almost always much nicer if you've had an informal chat and coffee with somebody to then be able to pick up the phone to them rather than the first time you pick up that phone is about something difficult um so. I just, yeah and, and in my experience if you we you know if there's a complaint which has gone through to the monitoring officer the first thing they come back for is have they had training well yeah uh, if the monitor officer is not willing to offer that training to the town and parish council i don't know where they're expecting that training to come from yeah. for that individual unless yeah. they're expecting you know the town clerk or you know, somebody within the council to provide that training yeah. to all councils i do it for my members but it's always just a a common uh, theme um, and which varies on different authorities whether the monitor officer provides training or whether they um, don't. So. Yeah absolutely and I think it's um, it's helpful for for it to be done with um, with particular principal authorities offering that training because although you can come along to generic training, it's useful to know exactly what happens and what approach that monitoring officer is going to take. And again, you actually get to see the monitoring officer. You know, how many people know who the monitoring officer is and what they look like and what their approach is likely to be. So I think that's really important. Again, Veronica, you've popped up to say, um, yes, Wales is fantastic. So they have a very different regime from, from in England. Um, and it is really good. Um, sometimes I do think that the uh, the devolved authorities have a really um, a really sensible approach to things like this. So yeah, 
Thank you. We've still got a few questions from Helen, Lynn, Lydia and Gemma. So get your uh, uh, video and mics ready. I guess while we're on the topic of um, Wales, may jump the Q uh, queue, queue, question Q queue, with Lynn saying she's a clerk working in Wales and she's trying to work out whether the two systems align. No, they don't. Wales, in my view, Wales has a much better system. Uh, so Wales have their own code. They um, they deal with things better, um, in my view. Obviously, there are still issues. There are still problems, um, but it is better thought through. And actually, that's quite interesting. That that as a reflection. So I do quite a lot of um, planning work as well, and it's very interesting to see how the law is diverging um, between England and Wales, and actually how Wales is thinking through their laws and thinking whether they're fit for purpose. Um, and in my view, they have thought through standards in a much better way. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Helen, got a problem with planning, which just came up then? Are yeah, you there? sorry. I have All got right. background noise because I'm working from home. So <laughs> no worries. <laughs> You'll kill me. Okay. Um, I received a complaint yesterday about a councillor who I've been told has been working with other residents against a planning application. Apparently there's a group of them in their area who met up and weren't happy about this um, application. Um, I understand that was in a personal capacity. He is, however, on the planning committee but didn't attend the meeting when the application was discussed and posted his personal comments to the planning authority after the parish council meeting was held. Um, there's concern, however, that he's staring in the background. However, if that is not with his councillor hat on, is that okay? Or would it be seen as breaking the code of conduct as he is known to be a councillor? Okay. I think that's really complex and I don't think that I can answer that right now. What I would say, what I would say is talking about general principles. So um, in terms of planning, this can cause real problems. Um, and particularly when you have somebody who is a parish councillor and also is um, on a planning authority somewhere and the planning committee, that can cause real problems. It sounds like they might have done the right thing in terms of not sitting at that or not being involved in that particular application. Um, but I would think about how this works, think about whether you can disentangle um, all the issues, think about, oh, and again, this, this goes back to complaints. Sometimes there's sort of lots of, you know, mutterings that somebody said this and somebody said that and what you actually want to do is look at the the individual parts of the picture and actually work out exactly what's happened so if you've had a formal complaint about this um then you know it should be going off to to the monitoring officer if it's an informal complaint have a look at those p's try and disentangle things see if there's somebody who who might be able to have a quiet word with them um, and just think about what the issues are. Because sometimes, as I say, sometimes people just don't, don't get it. They don't understand. You know, it's all clear in their mind about what they're doing, but it isn't clear to everybody else, and they don't necessarily know what other people think about what it is that they're doing. So um, in terms of general principles, if it's informal, can you deal with it informally? If it's not and it's a formal complaint send it off to your monitoring officer to deal with great thank you helen <clears throat> and thank you sally sorry i didn't thank you for your question earlier we're run over now do you have five more minutes fiona or absolutely yeah okay great thank you uh so lydia you had a question or are you still there Hi. Lydia? yeah yeah i'm still here i was just wondering how we can find out who our um principal authorities independent person is and whether the complainant is allowed to talk to them as well or just the person who has been complained against so um i would like to think that everybody knows who their independent person is but i have to say 
is quite difficult sometimes looking on you know websites to find out so you can contact your monitoring officer and ask them um, and that shouldn't be a problem um, the other issue was around who can talk to the monitoring officer so this is where it gets confusing in the localism act it's very clear that the person who is complained about can have access to the monitoring officer however the localism act is completely silent about whether the complainant can talk to the monitor uh, to the independent person sorry um, and that's a problem. So some principal authorities don't want the independent person to talk to the complainant, and some of them are happy to allow that to happen. Some independent persons actually are unhappy to talk to both, although they have to talk to the uh, subject member if they are asked to. And, and that's because it feels like it's compromising independence. And particularly if you're talking to one party and not to the other party, that feels like there's some inequality there and there's not true independence. Um, so it is actually quite difficult to unpick that and it will depend very much on the stance of the monitoring officer and the independent person as to where they want to go. So just to sum up, the the subject member can talk to the independent person, that's in legislation. What's not in legislation, and so it could go either way, is whether the complainant can talk to them. And that would just depend on your local arrangements. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, we've got a question. Gemma's got to leave, but uh, hopefully we can answer it and then she can watch the recording afterwards. A uh, question regarding members of the public who is an ex councillor causing disruption in meetings and being disrespectful all the time. So they're now a public member, but they're, uh, yeah, causing yeah. a nuisance, yeah. which is similar to, I would say, this other question from Elaine. She says, uh, my PC has had multiple code of conduct complaints sent to the MO about whole committees from one persistent complainant. All have come back, not in the interest to be investigated. No recourse. It's really destroying morale for the councillors. So a similar sort of question. Yeah. And you might want to, I mean, I think, again, it's helpful to think about as a council how you operate and to think about how you hold meetings and where you hold meetings um, and whether in certain circumstances the public or certain members of the public can be excluded. That's not something that should happen as a matter of course um, because it's really important that local decision making is open and transparent. However, if someone is disrupting that decision making, um, then you might want to think about what actions can be taken. Um, similarly, with a number of different complaints being made by the same person about different people, that might be something where the MO has obviously seen the complaints um, and probably the independent person as well, and whether it might be appropriate for some discussion um, to take place with that persistent complainant. Um, again, you know, always best to see if things can be resolved informally. Um, and there's clearly an issue with someone who's making persistent complaints. And it's quite helpful to try to work out what that problem is, um, rather than having to invest lots of lots of time, lots of officer time in actually investigating those complaints. So actually sometimes it's helpful for, for somebody um, to go out and talk to that person. Awesome, thank you very much, Fiona. Um, thanks for your time again. Uh, thanks thanks for coming back uh, to share your knowledge and answer questions from uh, the Town and Parish Clerks and Council community. Um, we're gonna wrap up now. If everyone who's on camera, put your camera on and please show your appreciation. Wave, clap. Um, thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much.
very much. Yeah, everyone, look at all those lovely waves there from everybody. Really appreciate your time, and also well done, Fiona, for taking time. You know, to get a spe you know get into your art again. Keep doing it. Um, oh. Yeah, after you've done the great job of bringing up all those kids. So, all right, take it easy. Everyone, have a really good day. Uh, cheers. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.